This is Art Sense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, we explore the life and work of the incredibly influential Spanish artist Antonio Tapias. 2023 will mark what would have been the artist's 100th birthday. Tapias's son, Tony Tapias, and daughter-in-law Natasha Hebert join me to discuss the materiality, philosophy, and symbolism that were hallmarks of Tapias's work, as well as details about the events planned to honor his centenary in the coming year. And now, a conversation about the life and legacy of Antoni Tapias with Tony Tapias and Natasha Hebert. Tasha Hebert, thank you so much for joining me this week on the Art Sense podcast. I wanted you guys to join me uh, this week uh, so that we could talk about the iconic artist Antone Tapies. You know, I guess a great starting question for you guys is for the person that may not be super familiar with Tapies's work for whatever reason. How would you start to describe the body of work that uh, that he left behind? Uh, my father, uh, Tapies, has a, a very large body of art because he, he began quite young, uh, in, I think in uh, 1943. And he worked uh, all the time until he, he passed away in, in 2012. So... It's a quite uh, large body of art, and he he passed through different periods. It's not exactly the same at the beginning, then uh, in the middle of the career, and at the end. Uh, at the beginning, uh, he had uh, quite influence from the surrealist, so he he, he has a, a period of some years. Uh, influenced by surrealism, but uh, also from the beginning he had a, a lot of interest in in a matter in in relief in the paintings. So the the oil paintings finally didn't work quite well for him, and he passed uh, very quickly to uh, the most known uh, materic paintings with. Uh, quite uh, relief and and uh, uh, he he could do a lot of marks, a lot of signs, scratchings, etc. And in general, I would say that my father was interested in uh, philosophy and spirituality in all religions, in fact, and. Uh, uh, I think his work was quite uh, transcendent, and um, I think he would like that the, the viewer understands that even very simple and humble uh, forms or objects can be very important in our life. This is why uh, you will find frequently images of socks or shoes or chairs or beds uh, which usually we don't understand that they are works of art or or, uh, or uh, objects that can be transformed in a work of art uh, but my father thought that was important to pinpoint the importance of very humble objects and things yeah. Mm -hmm. If I if I can add, um, Tapias was uh, very interested in the human experience and the human spirituality, but somehow finding what connects us together. And the idea was, uh, it's like in the Buddhist uh, religion, is when you drink in a cup of tea and you look inside the cup of tea, then you are able by this simple act to connect with every human being. 
So Tapias was very interested in finding these signs uh, that you can find through all the culture and through time because he was very interested in history as well. Mm -hmm. And I think he was, he was very curious about uh, graffiti, but graffiti from the beginning. I'm talking about graffiti from the, you know, the what you find in houses in Pompeii, the graffiti you found in ancient Greece. And at the same time, the graffiti that he will find in, in his own city. So he worked with this kind of graffiti and marks and, you know, small life, you know, marking themselves, you know, trying to make themselves universal and eternal. So, yeah. <laughs> there, there's so much to, to unpack there. You know, I think one of the interesting things is this this whole notion that the, the family's name, Tapies, means wall or to, to wall. And, and so the fact that he has a proclivity to kind of emulate graffiti uh, on these surfaces that, you you know, he was making, you know, I, I think one of the things that people were pushing back on his work in the beginning was that he wasn't even necessarily using paint you had to call them paintings for them to to fit a category, but he was he was making work, especially when you start talking about the materiality and the scratches and the marks. You know they they are closely tied to what somebody would see as the the scars and uh, history on the walls of a, of a civilization. Correct. Absolutely, absolutely. I think you really nailed it somehow. Like, yes, it's uh, it's this whole idea to like, how do you project yourself through your vanity and through living there and history? And I think the reference with scars also is very important. So it's the same as graffiti, but it's on your own body, your your body's history, and and all the time, like what makes you human, you know, through these uh, these experiences. I think he was also very impacted uh, uh, for the by the civil war in Spain uh, from thirty six to thirty nine. Uh, it was a, a terrible uh, war, and uh, it was a, a very political war also. And on the walls, you could see at this period many political graffitis. And uh, even impacts of of uh, bullets or bombs, and I think all this impacted into my my father's mind when he was uh, a teenager. I think one of the things when I look at your father's work, it it feels so contemporary, and it just feels um, like work that we would see being made by the people at the front edge of contemporary work today. I don't know if that speaks to how ahead of his time his thinking was or how influential he was on contemporary artists today. Even someone's sculpture like Doris Salcedo, in many ways, it reminds me of, of sculpture and work. Uh, I've seen Tapias. And, you know, Doris Salcedo grew up in Colombia during a time which was just as traumatic as the those early years during the Spanish Civil War. And so why why is it that when I look at this, you know, I'll see something from, from the 40s and 50s and think that it could have been made by a contemporary artist last week? <laughs> why, why is that? I think I, I don't want to be too mystical here, but I think that somehow it was... Uh, able to dig to dig very deep inside of his own creativity and it was uh for him it was very important somehow to be cut from the world when he would be creating so his studio was yeah, has he had no window he had two studios they had no windows uh it was very important for him to be able to like really get inside and you know and connect with what was inside and his own imaginary and imagination but somehow there's something very mystical coming out of it because it was able to connect with a source 
that is uh, it's so strong and this is why we say it's very universal and i don't know if it's a source of pain or joy or you know there's something about all of this together but it was uh, it, it was able to get there and i think some artists will say that they also are able to get to this place and it's a very special place when you talk about art and creativity and it's uh, you can call it the flow or you know something like that but i think it was able to put together all these readings all these observation about the world all these thinking but also the work that that he saw coming out of other artists like he wouldn't hide that he was influenced by other artists or that he was interested it was very competitive he wanted to know what was out there and he was trying to be the best and i think it was and and yes and i it's still very fresh it's incredibly it looks incredibly new there are no days when i look at paintings that i don't see something new that i haven't seen before so there's it's also there's also this kind of a uh, constant constant changing of the painting that you feel that the ma- the meaning is changing over time and i i don't know how i can explain this as well but it's very strong I, that's a really interesting comment because i feel like from you know the the interviews i've you know, listened to from tapias it feels like he was trying to create room for the viewer to create this reality. He felt like his work was just as realistic as figurative painting, but it was in that he was creating a space for someone to have a real emotional experience. And if we are filling in all of those gaps with our own experiences and emotions and whatever our baggage is, you know, maybe as our circumstances change, our readings of the paintings change and they speak to us in a different way. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And you also, if you look at the title, I, I love the titles because there's there's the simplest expression that you can find. So if in the painting you have an eight and a plus, then the painting is, is t- titled eight plus, you know? So it's like, if it's a square, it's titled a square. But the meaning is not there, like he's not giving you the meaning of the painting. But you see, yeah, of course, there's a square, but there's something way more important just beside it that is not naming. So maybe it's a skull, maybe it's a leg, maybe it's 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 physical, it's sexual, it's a scar, but it will not tell you what it is. It's not like scar from the war, you know, it's a triangle. And he was he was not very interested in in explaining uh, the sense of each painting. Uh, s- s- this is the reason why he put these literal titles very des- descriptive of, of uh, something in the painting, but no clue to, to explain the, what, what he was done. Uh, he wanted that the, the, view, the viewer has uh, his own explanation his own view uh, so the viewer has to 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 work a little bit <laughs> it's f- far uh, from anything de- decorative I, i've always found it really interesting and i'm, I'm sure tapias did also how certain symbols have a universal meaning across millennia across uh, societies and you know, for example, uh, the square is tied to the, the earth and the circle tied to the heavens. And that's whenever we see like Da Vinci's Vitruvian man, he puts the circle inside the square. And that man is different because he's at the, uh, you know, kind of uh, a bridge between here and beyond. And, um, you know, a cross could be tied to Christianity, but a cross is also the, the cardinal elements, you know, north, south, east, and west. And I feel like this is something that he thought a lot about, but he left a lot of doors open, correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. and some spontaneity, but also even, even if sometimes it looks very spontaneous and very improvised, uh, we can find sketches of some of these mm. paintings. So yes, it was well thought there was a thinking behind it but then it looks very spontaneous and improvised so and yes as you say like 
lots of doors are open and and you can you can play with it yourself and i think it's why people feel that the paintings are are so familiar and but unsettled like they don't always feel comfortable but they feel that it's talking to them somehow and i would i would just add a little thing because i saw uh i don't know anything about um chinese writing mm -hmm. but i saw some chinese people who were able to even read something in some tapia's painting oh wow like they were like not words really but something that felt very familiar for them some graffitis and they were like why what was he trying <coughs> to say you know and it's very interesting but because my father was very interested in in uh, japanese or chinese uh, calligraphy uh, so probably for the reason that uh, japanese people could feel very close to my father's paintings with that much use of symbolism in that work in living in a country that was you know part of a, a regime did anyone ever try to accuse him of you know communicate some sort of subversive rhetoric in those paintings well, what, what do you know? What, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, it's just that I think I don't think that people were accusing him of no, being no. subversive. I think was people were very pleased. Well, I in, think they in, were really open to the idea of you know. In the yeah. period of the dictatorship, uh, the government tried to use some Spanish contemporary artists to to promote uh, the, the Spanish regime but uh, most of them including my father uh, rejected any kind of uh, collaboration of course because my father was always for democracy and uh, and uh, uh, freedom uh, so mm, I think the political messages are quite subtle and uh, so uh, I think one day uh, the dictatorship Franco saw some of uh, his paintings and he said well if the the, the, the painters the actual painters are so uh, few uh, uh, so few uh, radical they don't annoy us because <laughs> he thought they have no power this was the thought of the the general franco yeah yeah, yeah. and it, it's interesting because uh, as the time passed through dictature and going toward democracy uh Tapia started to use more and more uh objects from the Catalan normal life, you know, some plates or some baskets or some, you know, that people would easily recognize. So these sculptures and paintings at the time, they were very empowering for the Catalan people, you mm -hmm. know, to start defining themselves as a, as a, a, a group of people, as a, as a specific culture, but also as being more and more proud on, of who they were. You know, by saying, oh, my God, these like simple objects, they mean something and they, they, they give me power, you know, and that was very simple. I'm talking really plate, chairs, basket, very simple object, ropes. And I think that was that was very subversive, actually. But in, I would like to add that, yes, some of his paintings were clearly political, clearly political. And at the period of the dictatorship, they could not show them in Spain. But uh, as uh, he had uh, galleries in France and New York, uh, they could show them there, but not here. That That's for sure. And so are those the ones that are tied specifically to Catalan and the ones that are very personal to the Catalan identity, because that's... Some of them, yeah, but there are others also, which are not specifically 
uh, in favor of uh, Catalonia uh, independence or autonomy, mm, but mm, they are really, really against the, the military regime. He, he could, could write assassins, uh, etc. But he, he could not show this in Spain. Can we talk a little bit about just how prolific he was in, in his creation? It, it felt like it was a, a daily practice that went on for, for decades and decades. Do we have a good idea of exactly how much work was produced in the end? Well, I, I cannot tell you how, how I cannot tell you the numbers, but yes, it's, uh, he was very prolific. And right now we are finishing the catalog resume, and the, the last volume is the, the the ninth volume. So we have nine volumes, thick ones, with all uh, the paintings, drawings, and sculpture. And there is another catalog resume for graphic work. So yes, he was. He 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 did work a lot. He worked a lot. Uh, I don't remember him having holidays. I don't mean that he worked every day, but uh, he he had a, a beautiful studio in the country house, and uh, he went there uh, from June to to October, and then there he worked every day. And then the rest of the year was more for uh, drawings, uh, prints. Uh, sometimes he went to France to do ceramics. Uh, Sketching, and, uh, it would do like his little sketch, you know, preparing yeah, for the yeah, next summer. Exactly. And uh, so, yes, yeah. he was very prolific. Yeah, yeah. But just to, to make it like a long story short, um, he... When he decided to be an artist, uh, his father told him that he would never be able to, you know, make a living and to support a family. And it was something very, very hurtful for him and very strong. And from day one, he decided <coughs> that, yes, it would be like prolific. It would be able to like survive and support the family. So uh, for him, that was very, very important to make sure that that his work was always like getting out and he had like work to show and shows, you know, and everything. So that would be his day. He was very disciplined about his day. Like every morning he would go to the studio. So he had like his whole like daily discipline, his year discipline, like what he would do in the winter, in the summer. And this for more than 60 years. Mm. So it's more than 60 years doing this, being having like a strong will and doing it every day, every day, every day. And it's it's amazing. And it's really not the archetype of the artist that we will you would imagine, you know, going to the bar and having like mm -hmm. moments that it would go crazy and parties. Know, parties. <laughs> no, 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 no. He would read like he was a collector, so he would like check everything, have his catalogs, look at everything. It was uh it was like it was in the house, in his studio, traveling a bit. Reading was very important from him, for him, and also music. Uh, he, so many, many afternoons he was in his um, uh, library. He had his own library on the top of the house, where it was calm. And uh, he he listened to to music. He ha he has he had uh, hundreds and hundreds of CDs of music. You know, I understand that when he was young, a teenager, he almost died by tuberculosis. The only treatment in those days was rest. And yeah. my understanding is that uh, he was kind of left to do nothing but read and draw for exactly. two years. And it seems like that kind of became the the daily practice that was mm -hmm. the foundation for how he spent the rest of his life, right? 
And th- that was also the time that he, uh, during which that he met his wife, correct? And can we talk yeah. about how how she influenced or supported his work? Well, she she influenced a lot uh, his work uh, in the sense that uh, she supported him a lot, uh, arranging uh, every day's life. Uh, for him to be comfortable and uh, uh, traveling always with him, being always uh, with him, yeah, uh, yeah, until the end, yes. Yeah. But the, your father was very impressed by her beauty. Like there yes. are like many portraits and yeah. and there's also many series that he made for his wife. Like he was very much in love with her mm. for like day one so she was very important but your mother was also was also very involved in yeah. the creative process yeah, yeah. and she i saw her like uh, curating exhibition and mm. going like to the hanging and you know she was uh she was very yeah. sometimes she, she's still uh, alive so she's a yeah. very strong woman and she is very strong will and you know she can sometimes be difficult sometimes <laughs> she could say well uh, this painting I, I don't like it very much <laughs> 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 my father was not very happy but uh, yeah well. she has strong strong opinions about yeah. hanging also yeah, yeah, you yeah. know she's like you know I, I think it's very good I think like she she grew with him mm. you know over time and they, they grew together and and yes, they were very complimentary. Yeah, absolutely. 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 I think it was very interesting that, you know, in in the middle of uh, Typius's career, or, you know, we say it's the middle, it's such a, a long, productive life, that he established the, the foundation in the museum while he was still able to provide input <laughs> in vision. Can you guys kind of talk about that process and the the legacy that he set the the groundwork for there? Yeah, well, at the period uh, when the the foundation was created uh, in Barcelona, we we didn't have a, a contemporary art museum, so he he felt uh, the obligation. To, to establish a place in his city where uh, one could uh, admire his work, but also admire the, the work of other artists. Uh, so he, he never wanted a kind of um, mausoleum, uh, but something alive where different artists could come and do shows. And also, uh, Establishing uh, a, an art library was very important for him, so he donated a lot of books, which was which were the the, the core of this library, who, who, which g- did grow uh, after. And he donated uh, many works to the foundation, many works from the beginning into to to the end. Every year he donated one, two paintings, some drawings, some prints. So right now they have a very important collection. Yes, and it's interesting because it's a it's not a random collection because he thought he thought of it. You know, that's there's intention in this collection. So I think it's uh, it's pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. Yeah, I recently had an artist, Glenn Brown, on the program who has held on to a great deal of his work and has recently opened up a, a similar sort of space where he lives in England. And one of the benefits that he said attracted him to that was the ability to have control of the works whenever someone wanted to set up an exhibition. He would have these core works that he drew inspiration from that he could access, but also key works that could be available for exhibition without having to, you know, ask for permission from this particular collector or worry about uh, what the condition is going to be or that it it winds up being a little bit easier uh, to put those uh, events together when that is in your control, right? 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think it's a pretty, I think at Tapias at the time was very, it was very visionary. I think that people wouldn't do that, but I think nowadays like artists have a, have a new approach to their like body of work and with all the studies that has been done with, you know, artist estate management and these kind of things. I think it's it's very brilliant today when artists start thinking like very early, like what do I want to keep? How do I want it to grow? How much control do I want to have over my career and my body of work and everything? I think it's quite brilliant that our artists are starting to doing that instead of just trying to sell or move things around and survive. And I think that you need a very good vision of where you want to go. But there's also an afterlife thought. You know, you right. want, as an artist, you want to be mortal and you want to keep, like, your body of work together somehow. You want to have control over, like, future interpretation. And also you have all these issues with errancies, like, where are your work going to go? Is there going to be, like, a massive auction when you die? You know, all these questions. These questions. And when they, they keep it together in a foundation or a museum, then it's way more difficult to, you know, destroy what, what you've built. We're, we're on the eve of what would have been Tapias's 100th birthday. So we are celebrating the, the centenary of, uh, of this artist. And I know that there was a recent uh, exhibit at Pace, Transmaterial, but there are other shows coming up. Can you guys kind of talk about what exhibitions and programs are planned to honor Tapies this year? Well, the, the Manolo Borja, the director of the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid, is organizing a uh, a big show, uh, uh, and uh, the first ex venue will be in Brussels in the Musée de Beaux Arts de, de Bruxelles at the end of twenty three. No, and sorry, it's September. Next September. Next September. Yes. Twenty three. Twenty three. And then the show will go to Madrid to the Reina Sofia with more with more paintings uh, from, I think, from January to March, maybe. Um, yeah. And well, then after that, the in, show will come well, to the foundation in Barcelona. Yes, yes. Mm. So it's going to be like a tour that is going to take a, a year, probably. Yeah. yeah, it's a year. So you have like four months in Brussels mm. and then about four months in Madrid. And then it goes to the foundation. Mm. So this will be very, very interesting. And there's something very symbolic also. Manolo Boja is a very important uh, director and curator. But Manolo started his career uh, with Tapies. So he did his PhD on Tapies at the time at Columbia University. And when Tapies <coughs> opened the foundation, Manolo Bojav was the first director mm. at the foundation. So the great exhibitions from the beginning and the, all this creative energy coming out of Tapies and Manolo, I mean, they were, they were very strong together. Mm. And I think it's beautiful to see now Manolo is like ending his career and he, he really wanted to end it with, mm. with Tapies which we, we're super excited about. I think it's going to be very interesting and very good to see. I, I'd be really interested to, to hear his take on the kind of undertaking it would take for a curator. And, and, and I guess, Natasha, you're, you've also curated shows like this, but to, you know, when you have nine volumes of a catalog resume, <laughs> right, there, there are so many different stories you can tell and you know do do we have an idea yet exactly what story will be told i mean will it be chronological by room or it will it be by commonality of theme i don't i don't i we don't know we yet don't know. We've seen a part of the list of work, and I think it's, uh, it's very interesting. Like, it's not necessarily going for uh, the more commercial, let's say, but you, you start to see that, yes, it's telling a story. There's mm. something, and it's, I it, don't think it's going to miss anything. Yeah, it will be a, a, an anthological exhibition, but uh, I don't know exactly if there is also a precise idea or story 
this I, I can I can I can tell you because I I don't know. Yeah, uh, what's what's also interesting is that Manolo has uh, has a, a great power, you know, because he's at the Reina Sofia, so he's, he has access to collectors and you know different people in, in the world and. I think is a because of this power he's able to you know borrow very interesting artwork that we haven't seen for a long time. So this is why it's going to be exciting for us as well. So we're going to discover new things that old things that are new for us again. So you know he will be there in spirit. And what do you think he would want people to to walk away from this exhibit? Or people that you know go to the foundation for the first time, or who dis, you know try to discover his work. What what would he hope people to take away as as his legacy? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I think he would be very happy, uh, and then I think uh, he would be happy to attract new publics to his work. Uh, new public to the Tapias Foundation in Barcelona. Yeah. Younger crowds. Younger crowds. Exactly. Yes. People who are able to read the work in a different way. I think it's mm. very exciting. So you can have like people having new interpretation and feeling connected and mm. feeling touched. Uh, also, what I think is very important is the, the fact that Tapias, every, every painting of artwork is some sort of a piece of a puzzle so the more you see mm. the more you understand the whole puzzle like you get the whole image so it's some sort of an alphabet which is something that has been used quite often the concept of alphabet like the tapias alphabet mm -hmm. so it's the idea that the more you read tapias the more you're able to read tapias mm. so when you finish and you go back at the beginning and you reread it all over again and you're like okay like i start to get it so I I really hope that people will be like hungry for more and, you know, we'll start to develop this kind of uh, reading to go a little deeper and to get out of some very uh, typical idea that they have of Tapias that are sometimes like very narrow and to be able to go beyond and to be like, wow, to be in awe with this artist. Because we are, we are like every day. We are like so impressed and yeah. and passionate about about his work. It was his uh, way of working. Uh, he, he never said, uh, "I will do a drawing or I will do a, a painting." When he was doing drawings, uh, he put in front maybe twenty papers, and he did twenty drawings. Uh, because all of them were, as Natasha says, a part of the parcel. Mm. And for the paintings, was, it was more or less the same. Mm. Yes. Tony, Natasha, I really appreciate you guys taking the time uh, to sit down and, and have this conversation about the amazing, prolific career <laughs> of Tapias. And... <laughs> Uh, just the doors that uh, the work just opens up and uh, the opportunity for, for everyone to find something in there that, that speaks to them. And I, I really appreciate uh, your guys' uh, generosity in, in uh, being willing to have a conversation today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to you for your interest. Thank yes, you it was lovely. Thank you for being curious. Yes. You know, for right. the job that you're doing. And, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's very good. Thank you. That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to ArtSense. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. And if you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read the transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening.